And one of the ways in which Plan Colombia became law and, and funneled all these hundreds of millions of military assistance was that liberals were told that human rights would be protected. And two ways. One is that there would be a certification of the Colombian Army's human rights record before a certain percentage of the military aid could be released. And the other way, the other way is, it is a law that applies to military assistance all over the world by the U.S. called the Leahy Law, which pro prohibits assistance to any foreign military unit for which there is credible evidence that its members have committed gross human rights abuses unless those members have been brought to justice. Okay. So if the State Department has evidence that a unit has been killing civilians, then they're prohibited from giving assistance to, to that unit. So we began to map out where the assistance is going and where the killings are happening. And we were working with Colombian human rights organizations that we developed relationships with as a part of that expansion of our work beyond San Jose de Partavo. And those organizations have documented more than 3,000 civilian killings since 2002. Most of them false positives. Most of them claimed as guerrillas killed in combat. And um, we uh, learned that in what we wanted to do, we wanted to see whether the Leahy Amendment is being fulfilled and what it would require to actually comply with the Leahy Amendment in Colombia. In part because Colombia, we were told by the State Department, is implementing, the, the U.S. is implementing the Leahy Amendment better in Colombia than any other place in the world. So, Colombia used to be the third highest recipient of U.S. military aid, not anymore. Pakistan is getting billions of dollars every year. Iraq, Israel, Egypt, Mexico is getting more. So if all of these places are the Leahy Amendment is not being implemented as well, then how, how are we doing in Colombia? And we learned that if the U.S. were implementing the Leahy Amendment, they would have to cut assistance to practically every territorial army brigade. And one of the few that we could not document direct killings attributed to that brigade was the one in Vichada that this guy John Kirama was talking about on the TV last night. In other words, even even those where there were killings that were not documented, they, they are now. <laughs> so we're in, a, we're in a, we submitted this report and we've publicized it and we're now saying to the State Department, okay, we'll take our recommendations. And they are resisting. They're saying we don't, we don't accept your methodology. Um, so we're kind of going back to them and trying to, you know, one of the things that Joe's readings do for me is they, they challenge me to keep that systemic analysis, the, not to just take little pieces of what's wrong, but to understand the whole of what's wrong and really take that on. And the way the State Department or the U.S. government can respond to you, you're, they'll say, okay, well, let's just work on some cases. Let's just look at one brigade here or one brigade there. But the problem is, it's a systemic issue. Because we also looked at not just, the, the Leahy Amendment looks back in time. And it looks at what happened, what the Colombian military did. They're the bad guys, right? We're going to judge whether they're dirty or they're clean. But we also wanted to know what happens after the U.S. assistance is given. What's the U.S. role in all of this? So we isolated instances where U.S. military assistance to a brigade jurisdiction was increased substantially, and what happened after that in terms of uh, civilian killings by the military, and found that on average, the number of killings in those areas increased by 56%. And when the U.S. military aid to those areas decreased, the number of killings also decreased by approximately the same amount. Which to me is even more important because it means that the U.S. actually has an opportunity to impact these killings of civilians. Now, um, 
the killing of civilians is is a um, it's hard to take. You know, it's hard to study. It's really easy to to look away, like Arundhati Roy was saying. Um, and one of the things that's happened is that in 2008, there was a there was a community in a, a working class community outside of Colombia called Soacha. And in that community, um, there were young men who were being recruited, and then they were taken hundreds of miles away, and within two days they were killed by the army and counted as guerrillas and killed in combat. So for their for the families, they were disappeared. They had no idea where they were, and it wasn't until there was a, a DNA lineup between some of their bodies that were counted as, as anonymous hundreds of miles away with uh, the search that these families had, that it was realized that these were young men who had, who had been disappeared and the army had executed them. When that became public in September 2008, it was a major scandal. And it was, it was a major scandal because of the work of human rights organizations around the world and the international pressure from the international community. The commander of the army was forced to resign. There were 29 army officials who were, who were cashiered. And most important, at that point, the number of civilian killings by the army went way down. It went way down. In other words, the army had the capacity to, to address it. I mean, they had control. So this is good, but 98% of those cases remain in impunity. The, the soldiers have not been brought to justice, which is what makes military assistance illegal under the Lake Amendment. But it also means that the families are still trying to get justice. There's a woman named um, Flor Hilda Hernandez, whose son Elkin was killed in early March of 2008. In Sawa from Sawacha. And um, she's among the mothers from Sawacha who have been threatened and um, have persisted. Uh, they're the soldiers who were on trial for um, the killing of these young men were in January of this year released because the terms for the amount of time for their trials had expired. Um, they're still technically indicted, but uh, the, the chance for, for justice in their cases is, is, doesn't rely on the Colombian justice system anymore. Now it relies on the international community. So Flor Illa came to Washington a couple weeks ago, and I sat in on a, on a meeting that, that she had with uh, the different groups that work on Colombia. And she talked about her son and she said, you know, he was my right hand. And his death cannot have been in vain. It cannot have been in vain. She was crying. Everybody in the room was crying. And she visited the State Department and the Defense Department and all these people on Capitol Hill. And those people, they're, they're there. They're inside. You know, like most people in those positions, I don't think most of the time, are acting on, on that heart that's inside. But it's there. And when Florida spoke to them, they reached them. But then she goes back to her home in Soacha. And then, as Joe said, it's up to us. And as it happens, the unit that killed her son Elkin was also supported by the United States right in the months before his murder. So, um, we are uh, working to put pressure on the State Department to live up to the, the, the self-image that we have of ourselves as caring about human rights. 